All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Deandra Coleman. I'm with the Virginia SBDC Network. For those of you that are not familiar with our organization, Virginia SBDC is a partnership program between the U.S. Small Business Administration, George Mason University, and local host institutions throughout Virginia. With 27 locations across the Commonwealth, we provide training and technical assistance to small businesses in their local communities. Our one-on-one -on -one consulting services are available at no charge. Today's webinar, Learn About U.S. Design Patents, is presented by the Virginia SBDC in collaboration with the United States Patent and Trademark Office, and it is the last in a series of four webinars that we've had with the USPTO. And of course, you can find those on our website, on the recordings, if you'd like to go back and view those webinars. <clears throat> we are also recording today's presentation, and it will be posted on our website, virginiasbdc.org. Due to the large number of participants, everyone's microphone is muted, but if you have questions during the presentation, you can type those into the Q&A box. If we are unable to get to your question, you can email us at help at virginiasbdc.org after the webinar and ask your question there. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our presenter for today's session. With experience as a web designer and developer, Garth joined the USPTO in 2005 as a patent examiner in designs. In 2014, he was promoted to supervisory patent examiner and began working with the Patent Training Academy, where he has had a significant role in the training of all new design examiners. Garth joined the Rocky Mountain Regional USPTO management team in 2017. He became supervisory patent examiner of a single art unit and in 2019 began training for the entire technology center. He is continuing his work as a supervisor in designs and joins us today to share his ex expertise. Please join me, everyone, in welcoming our presenter for today, Garth Rademacher. Hi, everyone. Uh, good to see you all, sort of. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a bit about design patents today. Um, I know that it's a it's a big topic, and what usually happens is that I get scheduled for an hour, and I end up uh, with about three hours of Q&A afterwards. Um, and so if, if uh, I'll have my email address and stuff at the end, if you uh, if you have questions that don't get answered, that's okay. You can send me an email or give me a call. Um, and my, I was just telling, uh, my, my plan with this, usually I try to be a little interactive with this. A lot of questions, I like being interrupted during the lecture, but um, I'm going to try to sort of not hustle the slides, but move through them pretty quickly uh, to go over what design patents are and hopefully give you a little information about them. But I'm guessing that your needs are specific and varied. Uh, so I'm going to try to leave a lot of time at the end for questions. Um, first off, you know, just a disclaimer. Um, you know, it's really hard to talk about designs for articles uh, without talking about companies, specific articles, you know, I'll probably say the word iPhone a couple times. Um, this is not an endorsement or, you know, I'm not trying to disparage any companies. It's just, it's hard to talk about this stuff without mentioning specific things. Uh, so please be aware of that. Um, so design patents. Um, there's two main kinds of patents, utility patents and design patents. Utility patents protect the way an article is used, the way it works. Um, design patents protect specifically the way something looks completely independently of how it functions or honestly even if it functions um, it's not about how it's made it's not about what's made of uh, it's just about what it looks like so we'll be talking about designs in terms of a maybe a little more philosophical way than you're used to um, the third type of patents is plant patents and those are really strange so if you are interested in that i would recommend looking into it but i definitely am the wrong person to ask um, so this is a uh, this 35 USC 171 is the statute that gives you the uh, the right to obtain a patent for any new invention, new design that you come up with. Um, and I want to point out one particular phrase: the protects the original. I'm uh, sorry. So whoever invents a new original and ornamental design for an article of manufacture, um, this is different from you know design patents. Sort of fills uh, a gap between trademark and copyright. Uh, I guess mainly, mainly copyright, which protects creative works, art, uh, you know, movies, literature, and utility patents, which protect how something works. So designs is sort of in the middle. The idea with these patents is that they're, they're, they're to protect the way an article looks that's for sale, saleable articles, as opposed to art, where you might just make one. Um, and that's that that comes up in some kind of strange ways, but 
I think it's important to point out. Um, so let's talk about you know who, why would you want to protect a design? Um, why would that necessarily matter? Um, and this is like, this is it's a strange question. I get it all the time. Um, you know who cares about design? And the answer really is everyone. Um, it may not be the driving factor, but it's definitely something that you consider when you purchase most things. Um, you know, if, when you are buying a pair of shoes, it, you know, you probably are not going to buy them if they don't fit well, but you're probably also not going to buy them if you don't like how they look. So it, it really does matter. Uh, these two chairs here, these two chairs function the same way. I'm sure a gifted attorney could figure out a way of crafting a claim, maybe for the way the legs work in the, the first chair compared to the second. But design-wise, they're very different, and functionally, they basically do the same thing. Um, the chair on the left is a is a fancy designer chair, um, and it sells for a fancy designer price. Uh, that number is actually a little bit out of date. It's more closer to sixty five hundred dollars now. Um, that chair is called the Barcelona chair. It was designed, I think, I was in the forties or the fifties. Uh, I'm thinking it's. It's Miles Bandero. It's been a long time since I've looked it up, unfortunately. But it's it's an extremely, I mean, it's it's a, it's a chair that once you've seen it, once you know what it is, you will see it everywhere. Uh, and places like law firms will have six of these in their waiting room, um, you know, and they're not doing it because it's cheap. They're doing it because it presents a certain face to you. They're using the design of the chair to show something about themselves from the get-go. And that's why it sells for so much. It's it's very sought after. And you know, the idea with design patents is that we want to protect that. When this chair was designed, um, the designer didn't just do that. He spent a long time coming up with it, went through a lot of iterations. And for most products, that's what happens. You spend a long time designing it, refining the design. And so for designers and sellers, they want to make sure that that is protected. Their investment is protected. Uh, can you skip to the next slide? Thanks. Um, you know, you've spent all this time. It's very easy for someone to come in. You know, the, the, the minute you start selling something and it sells well, you're going to have people who are coming out of the woodwork ripping you off. <laughs> That's just the nature of society, I guess. I don't know. Um, and this ensures, you know, when you get a design patent for something, it gives you a monopoly to sell that design. Um, and for the public, for the consumer, uh, that's good for me because that, you know, if 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 you feel like you're just going to get your stuff ripped off, you're not going to design anything. So it encourages people to create new designs. And it also encourages competitors to make something better. That's kind of the rub with design patents. You know, we talk about how it's a monopoly and it's good for the designer. Um, but what's the government's interest in doing that for the public? The government's interest is that it encourages your competitors to design something better. Um, and it all keeps moving forward like that. So that's why we give out design patents. Uh, as I mentioned, design patents are a, a monopoly. Uh, if you get a patent for a design, you're given the sole, uh, the sole ability to make that for a term of 15 years. Uh, that used to be 14 years. But a couple of years ago, uh, back in 2015, we changed we changed our patent term to fall more in line with international standards. So if you apply for a design patent now, it's 15 years from grant, which is a bit different from utility, which is I believe 20 years from filing. Um, we 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 tend to crank through the applications pretty quickly. The average time to hear from an examiner once you filed for a design patent uh, filed for a design patent is about uh, I think 13 months now. Uh, we're trying very hard to get that under a year, which I suspect we'll do this year or next. And the average time to actually get uh, we call it final disposition, where either you've exhausted all of your responsibility or the application's been allowed, is about 18 months right now on average. Um, I don't want, just want to mention that because you may hear that design patents are valid for 14 years. That is an old, an older standard. Um, so what can design patents protect? I mentioned that they protect the way an article looks. Uh, more specifically, we talk about the configuration embodied in an article, which is a very fancy way of saying the shape of something. Um, you can also protect independent of that physical shape. You can protect surface ornamentation applied to an article. Um, and I, I want to point out here, this is, you know, in this example, you see this sort of ribbon with these bells. Like this is about um, really ornamental uh, service indicia as opposed to things like a logo. 
um, or you know a slogan, which is more that's that's sort of the area of trademark as opposed to design patents. Uh, and then we come to sort of the configuration of both, where you've got a configuration of an article with a surface pattern applied to it. Um, you know, mo and we we see all of these every day. Um, I think, uh, and we'll we'll touch in a minute on those broken lines, but you you really can. I encourage you to think about what you want to protect in terms of what is. I mentioned that word novel before about your design. Um, is is the is the shape of it important? Is the pattern you've applied to the article more important? Um, and that kind of gets into scope of protection. Um, the broken lines in that second figure, um, in this, these next few figures, we'll talk about the broken lines in design drawings. You have to describe them, but we understand that typically they they don't form a part of the claim. Uh, can you jump to the next slide, please? Thanks. So. Uh, a design can the the claim can be directed to the full article. On the left, you see a ring. It's shown entirely in solid lines. Um, that is what is being protected. In the second uh, illustration, there you have a ring, but the gemstone is in broken lines. That means that the the claim is not directed to that portion. It's been shown so that we understand uh, how this will look once it's ultimately made. Gives us a little bit of better understanding of the way it works. Um, which is again not really protected the way it works, but it is part of you know when we search, we're looking for things. Uh, it, it helps the examiner understand where to look. Um, that gemstone is not protected or part of the claim, which means that that claim can be have any gemstone in it, and the band portion will still be protected. Uh, that gives the the applicant, the patent holder, the latitude to change the cut of that gemstone without worrying that if I change the cut, now I've changed something about the design and my protections might not hold as well. Um, and I guess more importantly, it means that somebody else can't come along and say, "Oh, well, they've got this this uh, very fancy ring here. I'm going to put a I'm going to put a marquee cut in that and uh, and get around their patent by doing that." Uh, and then in the third instance, they've done kind of the opposite. They're protecting the configuration of the gemstones as opposed to, and they're, and they're not protecting the band portion. Uh, they've, you know, they've decided that the band portion is not as important to what they want to want to do. Um, and this is, you know, I talked with an applicant a while ago and he gave me a very interesting way of looking at this that I've, I found I found fascinating. I've, I've talked about it ever since, which is, you know, he didn't just think about what his design was he thought about if somebody was going to design around this they see my product my product is selling well they want to get in on that they're not probably they're not going to just do the exact same thing they're probably going to try to change it a little bit to make it different and if they were going to do that how do you think that they would do that are they going to make this you know this curved edge squared are they going to change the band portion to make it a little bit different in shape, you know. They're, they're thinking about. He was thinking about what the important parts, the salient parts of his design were, and protecting just those elements, so that basically the somebody who was trying to infringe on that design would have less room to move around and change things, uh, and the patent would still uh, would would still hold. So, I want to talk a little bit also about the way you show us your design. Um, I want to also mention a couple of things about foreign offices here. Um, in some offices, uh, China, for example, you have to show certain specific views. In China, you're required to show front, back, left, right, top, bottom, and one perspective. And that's, I think, all you're allowed to show. You're required to show those specific seven views. Um, we don't have that requirement. We let you show us the design in whatever way you think best discloses it to us. Uh, which means if you have, for example, in this case, you've got a, a teapot, which has an internal basket element, uh, not visible when it's all put together, you can show us an exploded view and show us what those internal components look like. Um, I do want to point out, though, that, you know, again, design patents, the purpose is to protect an article of manufacture being sold to the public. And with that, we're really focusing on parts of the article that are visible, maybe not specifically in everyday use, but that could be visible by the consumer. So if it's something where you have to break the article to see what's inside of it, um, you know, if you think about, for example, like a, a like an iPhone, um, you know, I have no idea what's going on inside of the iPhone. Um, protecting the parts, the internal components, um, that's not really, 
that's not typically what design patents are used for. Um, the idea again is the protect the external appearance, or if it is internal stuff, it's stuff that you would see as the owner of the article, such as the basket in a teapot. Um, you could also show us how your design looks if it changes, uh, has, has different positions of use. Uh, so in this case, it's a, this is a coffee pot. Uh, the bottom heating element can, I, guess, I presume, rotate. Uh, to take the coffee pot out from underneath the basket so that it's easier to take on and off the element. Um, it's fine to show us, you know, this is one view, this is another view of it shown in a different position of use. Uh, that's fine to do. And again, the protection is towards the ornamental appearance. It's not towards that functionality of a spinning bottom or something. Um, you know, back when people used to get pads for flip phones, uh, very common that they would show us the, the phone closed and then show us a whole bunch of views of it open. Um, protecting everything, every you know, the inside, the outside of it, and showing that it does open and close. Um, so you are allowed to do that. Um, and I want to touch on something else here, which is that this is a sort of a primary difference. If you're familiar with utility patents, you're allowed to have a lot of different claims in a utility patent. Um, in design patents, you're only allowed to have one claim. It is the ornamental appearance of this article, as you've shown and described it to us. And that can be kind of limiting, but you are allowed to show us multiple embodiments of that article. So if your design, if you've got a design and then you're kind of riffing on it, you've got a couple different versions of it that are all quite similar, um, you're allowed to put all of those in the same application and, and then get protection sort of for that collection of, of designs. And it's not, it's not so much that you're going to get protection for this design and this design and everything in between. Um, design patents are kind of what you see is what you get. So you'll get protection for, in this case, these three different designs of bowls, which are different, um, but you know they're substantially very similar. And the metric we kind of use for that decision is if I saw, if I saw, for example, a design of figure one in this patent application, and then the design of that middle one, figure five in a catalog somewhere designed by someone else, would I be giving a rejection to that? Uh, later on down the line, would that be considered an infringing design? If if we look at that, we say, yeah, that those are two, they're patentably indistinct is what we call it. If those are too similar, then we will allow you to keep those in the same application. Uh, if you file them in separate applications, we actually will, will issue, you'll get a, it's called a double patenting rejection. And you can overcome that, typically you can overcome it by submitting what's called a terminal disclaimer, which does, it does a lot of things. Primarily the two things it does are, it links the applications, uh, the patents that come from them, so that first they expire at the same time. One of the things you're doing is you're disclaiming the terminal end of that second patent that issues. So they both, it will expire at the same time. And in that case, this, the, the patent term for that second one might be shorter than, well, will be shorter than 15 years. Um, and then also it links them in terms of, uh, you're not allowed to then legally, you're not allowed to then uh, sell or license the design of the, that one, uh, one design to this company and then the second one to this other company uh, so that you're, you know, <laughs> essentially you've got one patent and you're, and you're getting two people to, to use it uh, without knowledge. So that goes, to, uh, that goes to first the ornamental appearance just in general are the appearances so similar that the public would confuse them. It also goes to what we call obviousness, which is, you know, are the modifications from one embodiment to the next obvious in view of prior art, in view of what's known in the art. Uh, in this case, these are three food containers. Uh, it's a, in that art, it's extremely well known to modify the shape, especially in only one, you know, direction proportion um, to accommodate more or less. Uh, so this is, you know, even though I would never confuse the design of figure one for the design of figure 15 there on the, on the right, um, they are considered uh, fine to keep in the same application. One question I get a lot from applicants is, you know, is it better to, if I've got my three embodiments, is it better to put them all in one application and maybe the examiner won't let you do that? Or is it better to file three separate applications and maybe have to link them? If they're all in the same application and the examiner feels that they cannot be, for example, let's say there was a fourth embodiment here and it was octagonal, very different in appearance. Um, 
the examiner would send you what's called a restriction requirement and make, and they would say, okay, look, uh, figures one, uh, sorry, embodiments one, two, and three, those are very similar. Those can be one group. Embodiment four, that's a second group. You need to choose which group you want to prosecute. Again, we've only got one claim. So having a design that's that different can't be in the same application, can't be protected by the same patent. Um, what happens in that case is you're allowed to then take that, you, you have to choose which one you want to go with, and then you're allowed to file a divisional application, we call it, for, this, for the other one, the non-elected embodiment or embodiments, um, in which case you still retain, you, it, provided you file it within the, the lifespan before that first patent issues, um, you're allowed to retain the original filing date. So you're not losing anything, you're just required to file a second application for it. Um, or a third or a fourth, depending how many different groups you've got. And so that question about, is it better to file a whole bunch of things in one application and let the examiner sort it out, or is it better to file a bunch of different applications? And I think the, the answer really is, you know, are you more concerned with time or with money? If you file one application, you're only paying one application fee. And maybe the examiner will group things in a way that you didn't see coming and they'll keep a lot of them together. And you'll only, if you have five designs, you'll only be required or have the option to file one divisional application, as opposed to if you started off and filed them each independently, you would have had to pay five application fees and, and all the fees associated throughout prosecution with those five applications. Um, and the, yeah, right, so the answer really is like, if you file all five at the same time, it costs five times as much but those patents will all issue around the same time. That initial, I mentioned around 13 months to first a first action from the examiner, that 13 months will all happen at once, usually. Um, if you file one application and the examiner says, oh, you've got to file these as divisional applications, that clock starts over when you file a new application. So you may only need to file two applications and save some money, but it might take you two and a half or three years before that second patent issues. So that's the question that that I think you need to ask yourself when it comes down to that. Um, it can be tricky. It can be tricky to figure out how the examiner is going to keep things together. Uh, you know, what is the different, what is a patentable distinction that's that's difficult to know unless you're really in the patent industry. An attorney might be able to help you with that, but the the lay person who's looking at their application, they they might not be looking at the same things as an examiner. Um, the last sort of patent issue I want to talk about is common barriers to enablement. Um, we have, by and large, in utility, most of the rejections that they give are based on uh, the, the novelty and obviousness standards. Someone has already invented this, or it would have been obvious in view of prior art to, you know, to modify one thing to make what you've come up with. Um, in designs, it's, <laughs> it's really tricky, actually, to... Uh, to design the same thing as somebody else. I, I guarantee you, for, for example, if I told you all to draw a bicycle, you would draw 15 completely different bicycles. Um, we deal with enablement quite often though, which is you know the part of the statute that says that what you disclose to us, your claim, it has to enable the public to make and use that design. And that can be kind of tricky. How do you make, how do you, how do you use a design? Um, but the, the, the focus really is on making it. How, can, can someone, and I'm not, I'm not talking about making, you know, making the tablet computer so it functions. I'm talking about the design only, sculpting it out of clay, for example. Um, we need to know exactly what your design looks like, and that can be specific. Um, for example, in the top left corner here, you have a, this is a very old, some kind of tablet computer or a gaming device. Um, and I understand generally what this device looks like from that illustration. But when it comes down to these tiny elements in the bottom below the screen, I don't know what those are. Are they buttons? Are they lights? Uh, are they switches that maybe, you know, have a physical, like they can toggle as a groove? I, I can't tell from what this is because the lines are merging. Um, they've, shown, they've shown us this at too small a scale to be understandable. Now, if that view was coupled with several enlarged views that showed close-ups of these button or light elements, uh, that would help. That would let me know, you know, every, every image doesn't need to be totally understandable as it is, but when I look at the disclosure as a whole, the way you've shown it to us, all the views, the way you've described it to us, so anything you've put in the specification, um, I need to understand what this thing looks like exactly. 
So that illustration, unfortunately, would not would not work. Um, we get applications sometimes. It's less now because we have electronic filing. With electronic filing for designs, it's fantastic. You can submit a PDF. It's the exact PDF that the examiner sees. Um, it used to be harder. It used to be that we'd get designs and we'd, uh, we'd scan the drawings in. Uh, we would sometimes get applicants faxing their designs to us. And you'd get something that looks kind of like this. Uh, it's a toner cartridge in the bottom left, which is so pixelated that it really, again, I can understand it generally, but I can't understand the specifics of that design. You know, I see that there's this sort of handle element on the on the left, the left side of the view, and there's something that wraps around the side. Is that is that a 3D contoured ridge? How does it meet with the body? Is it a is it a smooth connection or is it a, a hard corner there? Is it is it the same on the top and the bottom? You can't tell because it's too pixelated. Um, and so most applicants at this point they say, oh, I know, I'll I'll file photographs. That's can't go wrong with a photograph. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes and no. Photographs are great. Um, if they're poor quality photographs, they are not great. They, uh, you know, this example in the bottom right, it's uh, that's probably a, a, to be honest, it's probably a sort of a photocopy of a photograph. But um, we get photographs that are grainy, or the the highlights and the shadows are are blown out. And you know, for example, in this case, like I that bottom black area, I have no idea what's happening down there. It's just a black mass. Uh, the, the, it looks like it's sort of an arm on the, on the left side of this, kind of do a bunch of small elements. The photograph is too small to understand what those elements are, the little gears and stuff. Again, I don't need to know how they work, but I do need to know what they look like. And I can't tell from this drawing or this photograph rather, uh, that it looks like a swinging arm. The, the highlights are so blown out. It's effectively merged with the area next to it. I don't understand what those contours are. So photographs can be great. They need to be very clear, though. And that can be tricky. Um, you know, the I think my recommendation in these kind of cases, this, this is the problem. You file these things, and now you say, oh, well, I, I'll file some better photographs, or I'll file some additional drawings that show those little buttons on, on the bottom of that tablet. Um, well, now it's considered new matter. It's material that was not present in the application when you filed it. And we don't let you bring that in. You know, when you file, you get a filing date that establishes with us the date of your invention. Um, to enter things later, we don't have any way of knowing that you had that information when you initially filed the application. So we don't allow you to do it. Uh, so this is uh, the last two things I forgot to mention. Those are, you know, again, small scale drawings when you can't understand things. I've seen applicants who will file, you know, complicated things. This bottom right the article is a, it's an embroidery machine. They'll file six of these photographs on one sheet, and they're all so small you can't you can't understand anything. Or they'll only file, you know, we this is especially common coming from uh, from foreign countries. They'll file a front elevation view, and that's it. Uh, it's not enough views. We don't have we don't have a requirement that you show us a, any specific number of views. One view might be fine, but we do require that you show us enough views that we can understand your design. And if it's not enough to understand it, you're usually not going to have a lot of luck getting that information in after the fact. Um, and in that case, you know you're not able to file. You're not able to enter it in the new application. You're not able to file a continuing application to keep that filing date. You're stuck filing a brand new application with a brand new filing date. Which for a lot of applicants, if they, you know, they they think they thought they were on their game, they, they filed their patent application, they didn't release their product to the public until the next day. Then, twelve months later, they get an action from the examiner saying, "You, you know, we, we can't understand this. You'll need to file. You know, uh, they, they won't tell you this. We we leave it to you. But you know, you understand from the application. If I want to fix this, I'm going to have to file a new application. Well, now it's been more than a year since you disclosed the design to the public." And that's a statutory bar. You're not allowed to get a, a you have you have one year from public disclosure to apply for a patent. So that can be very tricky. Um, I would encourage you to think about if you're filing for a design patent and make sure, you know, independent, it's hard. It's hard when you've designed something, you know what it looks like. You are using this thing all the time. Um, it's hard to have that perspective take a step back and say, do I actually understand what this looks like from these views specifically? Um, 
If you don't, then you may need to add some additional views. And, and a piece of advice I give some applicants is we allow you to file an appendix. It's not part of the claim. I, in fact, I would encourage you if you do file an appendix to actually state, you know, the appendix forms no part of the claim uh, to make sure the examiner understands you're not trying to incorporate a bunch of extra stuff. But you can get your formal drawings or photographs prepared. I, I know that it's very, it can be very expensive to do that. You want to try to do as few as possible because of that. Um, but then also just take it, take, take the article itself, just take it in your backyard and take like 30 photos with your phone and submit that as an appendix. Um, again, it's not part of the claim, but you can use it. You can rely upon it later to enter that information as part of the formal drawings. So if you didn't show us the back very well and you have a photo of this, in that appendix, you are, it's likely you'll be able to add that information into the formal drawings at a later date because you've established that you had that at the filing date. Okay. I'm gonna talk about one more thing. I know we have some questions, I'm sure. Um, I, I would hate, <laughs> most people hear this and they think that, wow, this is very complicated. And it is, you know, it's a, the patents are a legal thing. Um, but it's, it's, it's also like, I hear people talk and they'll say, oh, it's just the way something looks. It's not that, you know, it's not that complicated. I like to talk about this case. This is a piece of case law from the 1930s. And it's got, it's probably got nothing to do with anything that you're ever going to do. But I find it fascinating. Uh, it, it's very, uh, philosophical. I think I, I like to think that, you know, I, I want to leave you all wondering what the hell just happened when you leave here. <laughs> so, um, Charles P. Sterling was a designer and he designed uh, stationery. And what he did was he took a, a piece of paper and he crushed it, or crumpled it up into a ball. And then he smoothed it out and applied ink to the paper, scraped the ink off and the ink uh, stuck in the places where the paper had folded. And then he put a piece of glass on top, photographed it, there's my stationery. That's my design for stationery. And I have no idea what happened during the prosecution of this uh, patent application. He applied for a for a design app, uh, design patent for the design of that stationery. I have no idea what happened during prosecution of it, but ultimately it ended up in the courts. And uh, they said that basically because, you know, as, as much as he had generated a process for creating this design, he had no actual way of knowing what that design would look like when he began that process. Uh, he didn't, you know, if, if he had done some like complicated intentional pleading on the paper, that might work. That might, you might be able to say, yeah, I, I think it would work. You'd say, oh yeah, he actually, he, he did this in this way. So it would look like the final product. What he was doing was more chaotic than that. He's just like crumpling it up into a ball. He had no control over where those lines were going to be when he smoothed that paper out. And so they said that because, you know, the last line in this, uh, this slide, his intellect did not create the design. His brain may have invented the process, but it did not invent the product. Uh, and he may have gotten a, uh, a utility patent for that process, but he was not able to obtain a design patent for that because he sort of, you know, he, he was not, as much as it came from him, he was not really the designer of it. He didn't have any control over it. So something to think about and and keep you up at night <laughs> uh that is really my entire presentation again i wanted to leave a lot of time for questions so let me see if i can pull up some of these uh, oh right there's my contact information please give me a call send me an email um i typically return calls within 24 hours i uh unfortunately i as a supervisor i'm in a lot of meetings and i can't always pick the phone up uh, email, uh, I get a lot of email. <laughs> it's, it's just the nature of the beast. If you send me an email and I don't get back to you the next day, please send me another email. Uh, I won't think that you're rude or pestering me. Um, I, I'll think that I'm rude for not having seen your email. And I, I apologize in advance about that if that happens. Uh, okay, so let me Sorry, see. Would you like me to go through the questions for you? Sure. That might make it easier for you. So don't have to worry have about that. Have a this. sip of this coffee. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> All right, so first question, once the design patent is awarded 15-year monopoly, 
Does the design have to be manufactured and sold in a minimum quantity in order for it to remain valid? No. And in fact, you don't have to ever make it at all. Um, you can get sort of a speculative <laughs> patent. Um, no, so with trademarks, I don't know a lot about trademarks. Trademarks are, as much as they're part of the same office, they're a very different beast from patents. Um, trademarks, you have to be actually using the mark that you have protection for. And if you stop using it, you lose that protection. Not so with design patents. Um, you, you have that protection for 15 years from grant, whether or not you are still making it, whether or not you ever make it. I feel like I was going to say something else about that, but I, nope. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, about enablement, I will be seeking mm -hmm. design patents for additive manufactured products, 3D printing. Okay. Would the print files for my products and or screenshots of the 3D items be required slash desired? Mm. Okay. So two things about that. The first thing is, as I mentioned, with the design patents, it's sort of what you see is what you get. The protection is for what you have, you know, the drawings or photos or 3D renderings that you've shown us and that get published in conjunction with your description. Uh, they are not for the product that you make, which, which first of all, that means that if you if you apply for it and then tweak the design a little bit, um, that difference is not protected. Uh, it, you, you get protection for exactly what's shown in the drawings. Um, so that's that's one aspect of I think what you're asking about is you know again you the protection is for exactly what you've shown us you're allowed to show us whatever you want <laughs> um, but that's the protection you're granted the other part of this I think is uh, I get this question a lot about 3D files things like uh, 3D PDFs or CAD files that you know I mean if, if when, when we get your drawings we're looking them over to make sure we understand this design. If you send us this three-dimensional file where you can rotate it and you know you see every angle of it, uh, that obviously will meet the enablement requirement. Uh, but the problem with that is twofold. First of all, we don't have the ability to really view those files. Um, is that coming in the future? Maybe. Um, but the other part of it is that you know we, the protection is on the published patent. And we don't have any way of publishing a three-dimensional file or a video. Um, so what 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 most applicants, I presume, do is they take those 3D rendering files and they rotate the article around and get you know they do you know screenshots of the of the you know print print out from this angle from this view what this would look like, and then make sure that they file enough of those that they have a full disclosure. What is your recommendation for the type of patent applicant if the patent is for the design of an accounting system? Ah, <laughs> right. Uh, design's a funny word. Yeah, we're talking about designs for products, physical designs, uh, industrial designs, um, designs for things like accounting software or uh, you know a, a design for a a computer system, these kinds of things. That is a that is a technical design, but not the kind of design that we're talking about. So that's probably best suited for a utility patent. Um, I, I, you know, we, <laughs> I mentioned before how trademarks are a different beast, you know, so are utility patents. They're, as much as they're very two sides of the same coin, um, I've, I've I'm not qualified to review utility patent application. So I, I couldn't tell you more than that. Um, if you're interested in getting a utility application, there's certainly people in our office who are happy to help you. Yes, and I believe it was Daniel. Uh, if you want to email us, we can kind of give you those resources as well and kind of uh, send you in the right direction. Um, how are the cases resolved where form follows function for related utility and design patents? Okay, uh, so a couple things about that. First of all, most things that people invent, make uh, articles, they're protectable by a lot of different kinds of intellectual property. Um, something like, for example, for example, a, a bottle of Coca-Cola. Um, there's trademark involved because they have the name Coca-Cola. Maybe they have that that uh, silhouette of the bottle. That's important. It's trademarked. Uh, there's copyright for the text that's written on the bottle. 
Uh, there are, I'm sure, innumerable utility patents for the way that bottle is made, uh, for getting the, how do you get the soda in the bottle and all that. Um, and then there are design patents for how, uh, you know, the, the physical shape of that bottle. And then, of course, there's trade secrets, which we, you know, isn't really under our purview, uh, like copyright, but, you know, no one knows how, no one knows a recipe for Coca-Cola. So one one thing can be protected a lot of different ways. Um, and, and you know, most people are not, uh, are not Coca-Cola or Nestle or whoever. They can't file for 50 different patents on one, <laughs> on one article. It's very expensive. Um, so, you know, what I'd encourage you to do is to sit down and think about, uh, you know, I, I think of these kinds of things as being sort of like uh, barriers. You know, I can never put up enough barriers that I totally wall myself in and no one can, can you know, get at what's mine. I can never put enough up, but I can put them strategically. I can pick the largest ones. I can pick the ones that are best suited to protecting me. Uh, what's, what's best for your specific thing that you've invented? Maybe it's a design patent for the way the thing looks because, you know, for example, if, you, if you've if you designed a teapot, I hate to break it to you, there's not a lot of new technology utility-wise for how a teapot works. That kind of got it hammered out a thousand years ago. Uh, design patents are great for that. Design patents for something like a, uh, like what, like a, you know, uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm struggling to think of something, but something where it's very easy to design the exact same thing uh, differently and do the same thing or where for example the design is you know you i'm trying to say something that maybe lamp? is a table lamp very good mm -hmm. something where you know you think about what's important about what you've designed are people buying it for the way it looks or are they buying it for what it does um i think that most people when they get down to it they're gonna want protection for both of those things um Unless you've, you're designing something software related or something that, you know, it's it's designed to sort of function inside of a box and that's, you know, you really see it. Um, most people care about the design, you know. Um, the other part of that is sort of like when, when uh, this gets into that, you know, we have some rejections that are pretty, they're pretty esoteric. The things like um, when the design for something, you know, when, what about when it can't be designed differently? Um, I, one of the articles I used to work on was uh, knife blades, as blades for things like everything from, you know, uh, pocket knives to saws. Um, and, you know, very commonly I'd see an application and it would be for this, you know, lo elongated blade and have these teeth that are spaced differently and some of them are sticking out at kind of odd angles. And, uh, but then if I looked, they, the applicant would very often also have a co-pending utility application. And in that application, they would talk about how, you know, those teeth are sticking out at those angles because it provides a faster cut. And the spacing is to prov provide a smoother cut. And they've maximized the speed and, uh, and, and smoothness by placing the teeth in this specific way. It's like, well, now all of a sudden you haven't really designed this because of how it looks. You've designed this because of how it functions. And that's not, again, that's not the, the point of design patents is to protect the way something looks, the design of it for saleable reasons, enticing the consumer. Um, designing it based on how it functions is not really a part of that. So if, if, the, if the, everything's going to have both, everything's got a function. But if it, doesn't, if it doesn't have a function, it's probably copyright, it's probably art. <laughs> but the, uh, if, if, if the design has been driven primarily by function, then that may be a barrier to getting a design patent. Uh, the, the last thing I want to mention, which is not part of your question, but I'll throw it in because it's, I think it's interesting, is you know, we, we, we talked about internal components. Um, we also talk about things that are hidden in use. You know, they, just, they just never get seen. So for example, you know, a, a hinge inside of a laptop. You know, do you ever actually see that element? Is it especially now where the, the, the laptop shell sort of encompasses the hinge element. And if it's something that you never see, as I mentioned, you have to break the article to get a patent for it, then you, you probably, the examiner's probably gonna give you a rejection saying that it's not something that the consumer ever sees. Um, that gets really weird really quickly. Um, there are a lot of things that are ultimately hidden in use that are, uh, 
for a time, the, the appearance of them is very important. Uh, the, <laughs> it's a little macabre. The classic example of this is a coffin, which is ultimately no one's looking at it. It gets buried in the ground, but for a brief time, its appearance is of substantial importance to, to people. Um, so that is totally appropriate to get a design patent for that. Uh, there's a very famous case, I think from the 80s, where an applicant applied for a, uh, for a design patent for design for a, a hip replacement device. And it was this kind of like, you know, ball and joint style hinge thing, that looked very rugged metal or something. Um, you know, the examiner gave them rejection saying, that, you know, if, if I need my hip replaced, I never see this. And I hope I never see it. <laughs> you know, it's going to be in my body, uh, never visible to anyone. Um, but the company who had applied for the patent, uh, they were able to show that they were, even though the the purchaser was a person who would never see it probably, the they were actually being marketed to doctors. And so that the they would send out these brochures and have big illustrations of this hip replacement device. And they were they were saying that they, you know, they included big photos because they want they designed this thing to look sturdy that it would you know you'd, you'd put this in someone and it would never break down um and they ultimately got that patent because again because for a we, we look at so in terms of the lifespan of an article we look at it from when it leaves the manufacturing floor to when it is ultimately disposed of thrown in the garbage uh what have you um if any at any point during that lifespan the design the appearance is of concern then that's appropriate for a design patent <laughs> i hope that answered a question that nobody asked <laughs> and, and the same the same person uh jay he said uh he was asking what if the function defines the design he suggested aerodynamics mm. and air for airfoil design okay so part of that would be, as I mentioned, uh, if the if the if it can't function the same way without being designed differently, if it can't function, I mean, obviously, if it can function reasonably, not the exact same, if it can function reasonably, uh, I'm trying to say, when we talk about the form, the the form is dictated by it, its its function. Uh, usually, what we say is, can you design it differently and still do the same job? Uh, you know, as I mentioned, teapots, they all function the same way, but they could all, because they can all look different, the different designs can perform that function, that, that is not considered dictated by its, its, uh, its function, the design. Um, something like an airfoil, I think that, here's the problem you might run into with that, is that that gets very um, engineering oriented, which is not something, I mean, design examiners have a variety of backgrounds, but very few of us have engineering degrees. Um, the person who would examine that application probably examines that type of uh, design all the time. They might know a lot about it, but they might not understand that, you know, for example, the way you've designed this thing or that thing is is uh, is functional in nature. And my concern would be that if you you would get the patent and then down the line, if somebody if you accuse someone of infringing on your design, they might say, well, but it can't fun it can't it can't work this way if you change the shape of it. And if they're able to show a court that, that might undermine the patent. So I think you know ex examiners are <laughs> examiners have a big job. We're tasked with knowing the designs for everything that exists in this world, which is impossible. Uh, <laughs> apparently now we're taxed with knowing about airfoils. Oh God. Um, we're human beings, we do the best we can. Patents are extremely, you know, we have, have extremely high validity rate, uh, but these kinds of things do happen where someone does later show that for some reason that patent shouldn't have been granted. I think if you're concerned that the design of this is really based on its function and it would not work if it was designed differently, um, I think that I would definitely, if if I was gonna file for a design patent about that, I would definitely probably talk with a, an attorney who might know, have a better understanding of it. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about how we can look at existing design patents to make sure our design sure. is unique and patentable? Absolutely. So exam as I mentioned, examiners are supposed to know about every article everywhere. Um, <laughs> we, we ex the examiner, when they get the application, they will perform a search. And the, the, they'll search primarily in three places. The first one is our database of US patents. 
you can look through this too. We have a, a, a search tool on our website, uspto.gov, that you can use to, uh, to look at US patents. It is not the speediest system. We have special software that we use that lets us flip through them very quickly. Not so much for you. Uh, you can, uh, not at the moment, but you can come into one of our regional offices uh, or our headquarters in Alexandria, Virginia. And, and we have stations set up there where you can use that same software to do a US patent search. Uh, you can also go into, we call them PTRCs, patent, uh, patent resource, hmm. I'm blanking what that means. <laughs> they're called PTRCs. They're in they're in a, a lot of libraries across the U.S. There are at least one or two in every state, I think, aside from Virginia. I don't know why not Virginia. I guess they figure headquarters is good enough. Um, but you can go into a library, and they have someone there who they're, they're a librarian, but they've been trained in patent stuff, and they can help you perform a search and use again that same that same software. Um, it's uh, patent and trademark resource centers. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I'd seen that uh, in one of our webinars. <laughs> it's the it's the danger of using these these uh, acronyms and acronyms. initialisms all the time. <laughs> yeah, it's like I, I start I stop I stop remembering what it actually means and just I know it is a PTRC. Yeah. Um, the other things that exams will look at they'll look at foreign databases, uh, which you can look at as well. If you go to, for example, let's say you wanted to look at, um, you know, Korean patents. You can go to the Korean, they have a website, you can go there and you can search the, the issued patents. Um, I will say this is a good point to, to point out, you know, different countries do things differently. Our system, we have a, an examination system where when you file an application with us, an examiner will review it, make sure it meets all these criteria such as being new and different and uh, enabled so that someone can make it. And when that patent issues, you have an extremely strong, uh, you know, there's a presumption of validity of that patent. Uh, other countries have a registration system where you submit your application and someone will look at it to make sure that you've filled the boxes out right and paid the appropriate fees, but there's no examination of what you filed. Uh, that has the benefit of being extremely fast. You often get your protection that day or the next day, but since it hasn't been examined, what will happen is, uh, you know, you're gonna go to enforce that registration a year from now and take that to a court depending on I mean, a different country depending on the system but take it to a court and and they will say you know we can't understand what your protection is even for you've shown us one blurry photograph how does that apply how, how, what, how does that show us what this person has created so you might be a little bit out of luck with that um so there are those systems you can look those over um so, so I know like when I look at through the European registration system, a lot of it's very good, but sometimes we'll see things. It's like, it's just, it's called, it's called a can opener and it's just this yellow square with a blurry black line. And I'm like, how is that a can opener? <laughs> I don't know what that actually is. Um, so there's a lot of stuff out there that's kind of just, I don't wanna say junk, but junk. Um, the third thing that examiners look at, and this is the most available to you and probably the, the thing most examiners, depending on the art, I guess, but most examiners use most frequently is we call it non-patent literature. And that's really just everything else. They will do a search on Amazon. They'll use Google and do an image search. They'll look videos up on YouTube. They'll look for this design out in the world. Not everything's protected by a patent. Uh, Oh, Garth, I think we lost you for a second. I think he's trying to get back in here. Let's see. Hi, did I lose you a second? A little bit, yeah. Sorry. You're good now. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, so yeah, so uh, they will look out in the real world for, for if this design is out there somewhere. Uh, I'm not sure if you caught that part. Not everyone gets a patent for everything. So there's plenty of things people don't get patents for. Uh, you know, one one example of that is uh, you know the fashion industry. Um, we have sort of a complicated relationship with the fashion industry because, as I said, it takes it can take a year and a half to get a, a patent for something. In the fashion industry, you know, you release that article, the, that article of clothing, and three months later, it's off the shelves. It's done. On to the next season. Um, they, they don't tend to, you know, we, we get plenty of patents for things that are in the fashion industry, but, but not for things that are like high-end fashion. They just don't consider us a, a resource that works well for them. And that's okay. There's, they have copyright, uh, other avenues to, to protect their stuff. We get the things we, I guess we get the stuff that's, uh, 
things where people don't expect the design to change very much over time, or they expect it to be something that, that they, you know, it's it's not it's independent of season. For example, uh, you know, exercise wear, um, that kind of thing. We have a lot of shoes. <laughs> Uh, do other countries recognize U.S. patents? Ah, uh, no. So, well, yes and no. <laughs> they, they recognize that they exist. Uh, <laughs> uh, your protection from a U.S. patent is in the U.S. If you want to get protection in a different country, you have to file in their country based on their system. Uh, that can be very different. Um, and I know that that's very difficult for, for companies who are, uh, you know, who are global. You can't file in every country. I think what most most applicants do is they sort of pick and choose where they where they expect infringement to happen, uh, where they expect most of their sales to happen. Um, the and again the laws and rules in different countries can be very different. What's protectable here might not be protectable in Europe, for example. Um, we do have a system called the Hague. This is, well, it's called. We have this thing called the Hague Agreement that was from about I want to say it's around. 2015, 2016, where uh, the Hague is an international group where you can file an application with the Hague and uh, specify a number of countries in that application. There are, I, I wouldn't want to put out a number, I'd be, I'd be guessing. There are a number of countries that are involved in this. And basically when you file that application with the Hague, it's basically kind of filing one application that gets forwarded on to all these different offices uh, throughout the world, whichever ones you specify. And we have agreements where that application, even though it looks different than uh, our domestic applications, we, we treat it as a, a domestic application, essentially. There are a couple of rules that are a little bit different, but essentially, you know, they've, we've tried to, they've tried to streamline the standards so they're fairly uniform across different countries, uh, which means that even though they are, there are differences, we've tweaked our rules a little bit so that you get something that is consistent with international stuff, but also consistent with our domestic stuff. Um, when I heard about this, I thought it was fantastic because I thought it was you file an application at the Hague and you get protection in whatever countries you specify. No, you file one application, which is really easy, and then you got to prosecute it eight times in eight different countries because each country will handle the application independently under their own rules, which again, as much as they try to make it uniform, they are there are differences. Uh, one example of this is, I know I mentioned about uh, different embodiments where you can have multiple designs that are substantially similar in the same application. In Europe, you're allowed to have multiple designs in the same application, provided they are in the same class. And the class is a, a, way of, it's a way of sorting articles manufacture. Uh, for example, furniture is a class. So you can have one application with a table, a chair, uh, a desk, and uh, a footrest all in one application, and that's totally fine in Europe. We would make you file divisional applications for, for all but one of those. Uh, I think we could squeeze in one more question. Uh, roughly, okay. what is the end-to-end -end cost for a design patent? Oh, great question. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, think, I think the design patents are, relatively speaking, a lot cheaper than uh, utility patents. I want to say the application cost, I think, is a $275. Uh, it scales based on whether you're a, a, a large entity, which is large companies, a small entity. I forget the exact specifications for that, but it's being the SBDC, I presume you all qualify. <laughs> um, and then micro entity, which is really for independent inventors. And there's a lot of weird stipulations about what qualifies you for that. For example, you have to, uh, I think you have to have not filed for more than eight patents before. Uh, you have to be, I think, it's either independent or fewer than fewer than five, something like that. I, you'd have to look it up. I, I don't want to misspeak. Um, so the, the prices do scale. Uh, I know in terms of when the office puts out numbers for attorneys and how much it costs for attorneys, we tend to talk in terms of the complexity of the application. So uh, does, uh, applications that are very complex for things like pharmaceuticals, those tend to cost, you know, thirty thousand dollars to prosecute the whole application the whole way through. Designs are on the simpler end of things. I want to say that the average cost for what we consider a uh, an, a simple application or a non-complicated application is around eight thousand um, dollars. I would encourage you, if you, you know, again, it's a legal thing. I would encourage you to speak with an attorney. Uh, we encourage everyone to speak with an attorney, uh, and also keep in mind, you know. 
most people think that you have to either you have to either have an attorney or not. You know, if you want an attorney, you've got to get them in early and they do everything for you. Um, you can do it a lot more piecemeal than that. You can contact an attorney and say, hey, I'm concerned that this might be out there. I'm fine for this application. Um, can you do a search for me? And they will charge you a fee and employ a searcher and do that search and get back with you. And then you can file the application or not on your own. Um, or maybe you'll say, look, you know what? I, I can... I can figure out how to file this application, no problem. I'll file it, and then when I get a response and it ends up being a rejection, that's when I'll get my attorney involved and we'll and we'll go over things that that way. So it can be piecemeal. You can save some money that way. Um, you know, again, I think my our office encourages everyone to work with an attorney just because it is as much as it's available to the public. It is a legal process, and it is much more complicated than than most people understand. All right. So, well, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Great. This is always this. This was fun. I, I love doing these things. Um, Good. My information um, should be, be visible to everyone. Please, like I said, when you wake up tomorrow, wondering what that, what the hell that guy was on about, send me an email. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So, guys, um, we will send everyone out this presentation via email. Uh, we'll also send out the recording, so you guys will have access to the slides and to Garth's information. Um, please utilize him because he is uh, a wealth of, of knowledge <laughs> and is uh, available for you to contact. So um, thank you, Garth. Um, if you'd like to sign up uh, for upcoming webinars, everyone, you can access recorded webinars as well at virginiasbdc.org slash training. Uh, we've also got the COVID Business Recovery Center on our website. Uh, developed to help owners not only continue business operations, but to thrive and recover. They are designed to be used in collaboration with your local SBDC advisors who can also help you out. Uh, you can sign up for free and confidential session by emailing help at virginiasbdc.org or via our website. And I put a few links for you all in the chat as well. Thank you, Garth, for spending your time and for answering so many questions. Um, it was a great session and thank you everyone. We hope to see you at the next session. Thanks everyone.